Let's go to the next chapter, hypercalcemia. Hypercalcemia is the money, right? I got five calciums there. There are five things you need to be familiar with. And I will tell you again, right? NBME, how much do you think they love these causes? Calcium is language. With calcium, they're telling you a story and it's a great story. All right, so what causes hypercalcemia? Primary hyperparathyroidism, primary hyperparathyroidism. It's in red, and I put primary in there. Why'd I do that? Does secondary hyperparathyroidism cause hypercalcemia? No, right? It's primary. Why doesn't secondary hyperparathyroidism cause hypercalcemia? Well, that's the next question. Need to distinguish why? You know, what's the calcium level in hyper secondary hyperparathyroidism, right? We've already said this is how things are re redundant, right? It's renal failure, and you have that calcium is bound to phosphate. Right, and you have no vitamin D, so you're not absorbing it. So the calcium in renal osteodystrophy is low. So the PTH is gonna be high, but the calcium is gonna be low. It's not part of the hypercalcemia protocol. And I already answered the question and there it is, right? Calcium in secondary hyperparathyroid low for those two reasons that I've already mentioned too many times. Um, phosphate level, so the phosphate, be prepared to see a phosphate level in hyperparathyroid states. In primary hyperparathyroidism, I've already said, the phosphate's gonna be low. That's gonna be part of the criteria. Students sometimes see a phosphate level, it's a lower limit in normal, and they say it's not low. It's just lower limit. It's, the bottom line is not high. So it tends toward low. Don't look for subnormal phosphate levels to make a diagnosis of hyperparathyroidism. All right, so we've made the diagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism with the lowish phosphate level. We have adenomas hyperplasia for the boards, and in reality, you know, ultimately it matters in terms of treatment, surgery, but it, there's no meaningful distinction. I'm just letting you know we have adenomas and for gland hyperplasia. Key associations, I've already told you about MEN2A, right, just 2A, and then the MEN1 syndromes. And again, same thing with the pituitary pancreas, they often will present with hypercalcemia. All right, continuing, we have primary hyperparathyroidism. What's the pathology? There, there's two bone pathologies that will come after you on. So one of them, just think about location, think about the lesion. The first is location, right? subperiosteal bone resorption. For some reason, it's not clear, you just have to know it, that the uh, hyperparathyroidism of PTH preferentially absorbs bone in the subperiosteal location of long tubular bones. Okay, so the, the language, they will either describe subperiosteal bone resorption, or more commonly, I see them use the phrase bowing of the digits. The digits don't actually bow on the x-ray you get the sense that the tubular bowl looks somewhat bowed, okay? So there's gonna be the language. So we're talking about hyperparathyroidism, uh, we're talking about the location, so periosteal, and we're talking about how they'll describe it as bowing. So the other pathology of the bone, osteitis fibrosis cystica, they told me this in medical school and residency, is like, what is it? And there are these lesions in the bone, how the hell am I gonna remember that? But I also knew they were called these brown tumors. Brown tumor didn't help me either. What is a brown tumor? right? Bone loss, because we stimulated the osteoclast indirectly, predisposed to microfractures with secondary hemorrhage. It's a microfracture with hemorrhage, and then you get granulation tissue. And now I know what it is. That's right. It's, it just makes sense. It's hyperparathyroidism. The osteoclasts do what osteoclasts do. They eat bone. And as a result of eating bone, they screw it up. They cause microfractures. You bleed in there. Osteitis fibrosis cystica. They don't ask you the mechanism, but it's good to know the mechanism so you can remember the darn thing. So we had two bone pathology lesions for hyperparathyroidism. So that, that's basically it. Hypophosphatemia, subperiosteal bone resorption, osteitis fibrosis cystica, and the association with MEN syndromes. Boom, you're on your way. All right, hypercalcemia malignancy. And this is a true story in Philadelphia where they write the exam, paraneoplastic phenomena in a big. So I've been to like picnics and barbecues down there. Guess what they talk about? You got it, paraneoplastic phenomenon. They're just fascinated by it. All right, so insofar as hypercalcemia um, malignancy mechanisms do matter, and they will make this distinction between PTH-related protein and cytokine-mediated bone destruction. So if they make the distinction, you have to make the distinction. And here's the language, right? So who does parathyroid-related protein as a cause of hypercalcemia? right? Hypercalcemia is part of tumor language. So let me just start with renal cell carcinoma. 
And what's the bottom line on renal cell, right? Yellow tumor on the renal poles, preferentially. Abundant uh, clear cytoplasm, right? Clear cell carcinoma. You need to be familiar with this image. This is one of the images they like, uh, renal cell carcinoma. You're going to see it, so that's one you want to hold on to. It's the kidney, so what else? What's the other perineoplastic syndrome associated with renal cell carcinoma? Is increased erythropoietin level. And so these patients are the ones who are going to present with elevated hemoglobin hematocrit. So if you have a patient with an elevated hemoglobin hematocrit and they give you hypercalcemia, what have they just told you? The patient has renal cell carcinoma. They didn't really tell you that. They're either going to show you the pathology or ask you the physical finding. How's a patient with renal cell carcinoma going to present? I don't know, hematuria, right? So that's how they're going to play the game. Other parathyroid-related protein, just on, let me start with the liver over here. So the liver, remember when you're little embryos, the liver is making our red cells initially, so it has this EPO capacity too. So the liver, right? So first of all, let me just say, well, I'm talking about hepatocellular carcinoma, any injurious lesion to the liver, so anything that causes cirrhosis predisposes the patient to hepatocellular carcinoma. And the perineoplastic phenomenon associated with hepatocellular carcinoma are gonna be that high erythrocytosis, and hypercalcemia. That's the language. What are they going to do? Well, they're going to give you a cirrhotic kind of condition or predisposing condition. They may talk to you about alpha feta protein. So, hepatocellular carcinoma, right, can present like renal cell. Well, with renal cell, they have to give you, you know, hematuria, cannonball lesions. Um, they have to do something to get you the kidney for the cirrhotic with that same presentation. They're going to have to give you something about the uh, liver. All right. And finally, the other player for parathyroid related protein. These are not the only ones in the body. These are just the common ones squamous cell carcinoma of the lung. And so, with the lung cancers, neoplasms, when they give you hypercalcemia, that's the language of squamous cell. Okay. So, it means something when they give you a pulmonary nodule, hypercalcemia. And the other thing they'll do probably with a squamous cell is give you the cavitary lesion, right? Cavitary lesion. So, you get a uh, chest x ray. There's a mass on the thing, you get a CT, it's showing cavitation. The, pet, the, the radiologist is going to say probable squamous cell carcinoma. So the cavitary lesion is part of it. As far as the squamous cell, they may talk about intercellular bridges, right? Desmosomes, demodus tissue between cells. Um, the intercellular bridges will be described not important. It's the keratin pearls. These keratin pearls, right? Images to know. Um, they're not going anywhere. You're going to see them in the esophagus. You can see them in the skin. You're going to see them in the head and neck. Um, so do, you know, images to know, keratin pearls. It's the language of squamous cell. Right. So again, calcium, hypercalcemia got us to these three tumors with all the derivatives that go with them. All right. So then those are PTH related. Then there's the cytokine mediated bone destruction. And the, and the biggest issue really is going to be multiple myeloma. Now, do they tell you the patient has multiple myeloma? They don't tell you anything, right? They just don't do that. Who's multiple myeloma? Elderly patient. You get to the criteria, right? Renal insufficiency and anemia. They may have rule of formation, recurrent pneumonia, right? They're immunocompromised that way. Abnormality on SPEP. We'll go over that. So they're going to give you all the other things with, uh, you know, background multiple myeloma, and it's going to include hypercalcemia, and they're going to ask you the mechanisms. What the mechanism? Cytokine mediated. And when we talk about the cytokine, right? IL-1, there are other cytokines, but IL-1, the other name for it is osteoclast activating factor. Right? That's what they mean by cytokine mediated. So IL-1, osteoclast activating factor. In fact, like um, estrogen was a mechanism of estrogen protecting bone. It actually reduces IL-1 activity. That's, that's how estrogen helps protect um, the bone. And why is that also relevant? <laughs> well, lo and behold, metastatic breast cancer. Breast cancer can truthfully be associated with PTH as well. Um, but for the boards where they use metastatic breast cancer, they're talking about cytokine mediated. All right, so we've done two disorders associated with uh, hypercalcemia, and they're all, again, big ticket items uh, for the boards. So now we're at thiazides. And let me just say straight away, before even progressing, if we just think for a second, what do thiazide diuretics do? They block absorption of you know, sodium chloride, a co-transporter. So you wind up with this decreased sodium. What's our body's response to decreased sodium, right? Aldose release, and the body fights back to try and absorb sodium. So in the proximal convoluted tubule, when you try and absorb sodium, guess who gets absorbed with sodium? It's calcium. So sodium and calcium are friends in the early tubules. They fight in the distal convoluted tubule. But in the proximal convoluted tubules, they're absorbed together. 
and in the proximal convoluted tubular callus, and they don't ask, but it's absorbed by these paracellular channels, not transcellular. So early on, so thiazide diuretic, you're increasing your sodium resorption as a counter-regulatory response. So consequently, right, you're increasing your calcium that way. And that's the principal mechanism of hypercalcemia associated with thiazides, okay? Downstream, we'll come back to that sodium calcium transporter. So I just mentioned volume depletion, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but when we talk about renal stones, which is the last lecture of the course, uh, we talk about high sodium diet. So part of preventing um, renal stones is a low sodium diet. So your body is absorbing sodium and calcium. High sodium diet, you're not absorbing sodium or calcium, predisposed to calcium oxalate stones. So, but that's down the road. But again, applied physiology, it just makes sense. All right, so the other thing uh, that the, uh, mechanisms associated with hypercalcemia and thiazide are in the distal convoluted tubule. You have decreased intracellular sodium in the, um, in the cells, and consequently, the body just tries to absorb more sodium, increasing sodium at the expense of calcium. You're increasing calcium resorption. So that's the second me mechanism of uh, hypercalcemia with thiazides. But ultimately, at the end of the day, with thiazides, right, think about using them therapeutically uh, for renal stones. You want to get calcium out of the lumen. And that's what this is, right? So we've inhibited sodium chloride uh, absorption, transcellular calcium um, uh, absorption causes hypercalcemia. But the real uh, implication ultimately comes back to renal stones that we'll get to in a second. You need to compare and contrast, right? The thiazides are causing hypercalcemia. Patients are, and that was one of the questions we did. Patients started on a medication for fluid overload, right? And develops hypercalcemia. Which diuretic were they started on? Thiazide. What does furosemide do? Furosemide is treatment for hypercalcemia. Why, right? So furosemide decreases sodium resorption in the ascending loop. And I told you calcium and sodium are friends over there, right? So by wasting sodium, right, not in the distal convoluted tubule, but in the proximal convoluted tubule, and in this case, the thick ascending loop, right, you're also wasting calcium. You waste sodium, you waste um, calcium uh, with furosemide. So one causes hypercalcemia, one's treatment for hypercalcemia. That makes sense. But, but the gist was fluid overload state, started on a medication, proven in symptom, two weeks later, it's data, right? So they're telling you the patient was put on a medication for fluid overload, um, and they developed hypercalcemia. What agent? It's a thiazide diuretic. These other uh, agents do not cause hypercalcemia. The answer was chlorothalidone. Um, the other thiazide diuretic, hydrochlorothiazide, and dapamide is also a, a thiazide diuretic. All right. Lastly, the last thing uh, associated with hypercalcemia, you know, get ectopic, one alpha hydroxylase, right? And how do you do that? So again, 1-alpha-hydroxylase activates vitamin D, the active form, 25-hydroxy is nowhere near as active. How do you get 1-alpha-hydroxylase? Lymphoma, sarcoid. Sarcoid, what does it do? It's these activated macrophages with these disorders uh, elaborate. They make 1-alpha-hydroxylase. It's ectopic production, right? And so what do you wind up with? Vitamin D success, right? You're not taking vitamin D. You're making extra vitamin D. Life is good. You're absorbing too much calcium. So that's going to be the mechanism. And here's how they used it in a question. We did this question. So the, the bottom line here is I'm going to get too caught up in the practice question so much as to understand what they do with calcium. All right, we're winding down here. But now, again, so we said hypercalcemia from vitamin D success. So vitamin D was the vitamin D story, uh, but you need sunlight uh, to convert essentially cholesterol, right? First step is 7-dehydrocholesterol uh, to cholecalciferol or ergocalciferol. And again, you can get the, both these through dietary sources as well, fortified food products. All right, you get to those. We understand the first hydroxylation step takes place in the liver, 25-hydroxylase. Then the kidney does its thing. If you have too much 1-alpha-hydroxylase, as we just saw, hypercalcemia from increased gut absorption. One is ectopic production. Another way to get to hypercalcemia is just take too much vitamin D, vitamin D success. I call this a gratuitous slide because the signs and symptoms of hypercalcemia, they're not really going to be specific. Invariably, there'll be data associated with it. But, you know, within the vignettes, they may talk about a patient being constipated, ulcer disease, pancreatitis. Polyuria, I just want to emphasize that for a second because it causes nephro, so hypercalcemia, nephrogenic DI, just like lithium. 
right? Too much lithium. They both interfere with the synthesis of the aquaporin channel. So you can wind up with nephrogenic DI, lithium. You can get it with hypercalcemia too. We understand that the hypercalcemic patient can present with stones, um, but again, that's going to usually be in the setting of hyperparathyroidism. CNS manifestations, the MSK manifestations are kind of nonspecific. All right, then ultimately treatments. What are the treatments? Well, we already talked about furosemide. You give furosemide to get sodium and calcium wasting, but you're also giving it with uh, saline, right? You want to counteract increased sodium calcium resorption. So you give them fluid, right, to get rid of calcium with furosemide. This phosphonates we'll talk about during MSK, but how do they work? Inhibit osteoclast, inhibit the ruffle border from forming. Osteoclast can't adhere. That's mechanism of action. We'll get there. So that's the second treatment. If they have primary hyperparathyroidism, resection. And then lastly, we talked about calcitonin, but really just temporizing rapid rebound. All right. So that was hypercalcemia. Let's do hypocalcemia. 